Thanks, Bree. Sorry, I'm slowly kind of navigating Zoom. There we are. Okay. That. Okay, so yeah, it's a pleasure to be speaking to you all today. We're really looking forward to this conversation. Um, so thank you so much for the invitation. Uh, I say the word conversation there because we'd really like to spend some time at the end of our presentation to discuss, you know, what our movements could be doing to drive forward a more kind of collaborative form of engineering um, and whether there are ways we could be working together more. Um, so please have a think about that over the next 10 to 15 minutes as we'd love to hear your thoughts, particularly as you guys are the experts in this area. Um, before that, we've got a bit of a presentation, obviously, that I'll walk you through now, if my laptop will help me out. There we go. Um, so we'll be covering a bit of an introduction to who we are, engineers at Borders UK, before discussing more collaborative approaches to engineering, considering what the benefits are and what that actually looks like in practice. And then we'll have that discussion with you looking ahead, what we could and should be doing as movements. If you do have any questions, please feel free to pick them up in the discussion or I can provide our email address and you can get in touch there. Um, so to kick us off, who are we? So Engineers Up Borders UK is a UK based charity working to put global responsibility at the heart of engineering. Our movement recognises that engineering has played a really significant role, both good and bad, in getting humankind to where we are today. So regardless of how you define engineering, whether that's problem solving or the application of science and maths or literally just building stuff, the fact remains that engineers play a really integral role in society impacting all of our lives every single day. Unfortunately, though, the engineering community still relies on practices that can't be sustained moving forward. And there's a continued treatment of the sector as something that's kind of neutral or apolitical or even isolated from the rest of society. However, when you consider the fact that the building and construction sector alone is responsible for 38% of global emissions, you know that something's got to change pretty drastically. So, at Engineers Without Borders UK, we recognise that we need to move away from those outdated working methods and prioritising profit over people and planet if we want to overcome the global problems that we're facing today and to really achieve social and environmental justice. And to do that, we need those working in and around engineering to really commit to global responsibility. And that's what our movement believes in. So as of last year, we set out a new strategy to really tackle this challenge. So how are we approaching this? Well, firstly, we strongly believe that bringing together a diverse group of individuals together under one common cause is really key to driving change. So we're growing a movement of people also seeking to transform the engineering sector. Alongside reaching these individuals, we realised that partnerships with strategically aligned organisations will also be critical to achieving the change that we want to see. And we know we need to collaborate across sectors if we want that whole system to change. And within this, we recognise that we can't actually expect everyone and every organisation to be perfectly globally responsible already. You know, overcoming social and environmental injustice is really complex and quite difficult. So we're keen to work with anyone who's looking to get better at being globally responsible from whatever, whatever the starting point they might be at. And finally, we want, we want to not only support everyone in the engineering community to learn more about globally responsible engineering, but to actually take urgent action to make changes and to do that by collaborating with others. So I've already thrown the term around a lot, but you know, what is globally responsible engineering? Um, our 2021 to 2030 strategy sets out four key principles for globally responsible engineering that we would like to see adopted across the engineering community and really embedded in the kind of culture of how engineering is taught and practiced. So we've got them on the side here. So the first one is responsible, that's to meet the needs of all people within the limits of our planet. And we really see that that should be something at the heart of engineering. Next, we have purposeful, which is to consider all the impacts of engineering from the project or product's inception up until the end of its life. And that's really thinking about local and global impacts across the supply chain um, and the social and environmental impacts. So next we have inclusive, and that's to, to ensure that diverse viewpoints and knowledge are included and respecting, respected in the engineering process. And then finally there we've got regenerative, which is to actively restore and regenerate ecological systems rather than just reducing impact, which is something that we're seeing um, more mainstream across 
um, sector at the moment, but how can we go further than just reducing impacts and just being sustainable? Um, what's really interesting, and hopefully you've picked up on this too, is that there's clearly a lot of shared values between our movements. Um, just picking out a few here, you know, we're talking about changing the culture of engineering and science, making that more accessible, communal and collaborative. That's something we clearly both value. It's also ensuring that everyone has a voice and is actually empowered to use it, whether they're within engineering or science communities or a part of the wider society that's actually impacted by all of our work. Um, and there's ensuring technologies are used to address social and ecological needs, something we're clearly both working towards. But ultimately, we're, we're both seeking system change, um, which is really exciting. And with those kind of commonalities in mind, we wanted to talk to you about collaborative engineering and the value of open source hardware in the sector and to really explore the kind of intersections of our movements more deeply. So to kick us off, I've just got a bit of a quote here that I've pulled from Joshua M. Pierce, um, who you may know for writing Open Source Lab. Um, he says, much of the widespread poverty, environmental desecration and waste of human life seen around the globe could be for could be prevented by known to humanity as a whole technologies, many of which are simply not available to those that need it. And I think what that nicely, I think that what that nicely summarizes is that we, you know, as a humanity now, uh, in a place where we have the expertise to deal with the complex global problems that we're faced with, that lack of knowledge and technology is not what's stopping us from tackling these issues. Our obstacle is, is instead seems to be our kind of refusal to collaborate and share that expertise, both within our own scientific communities and those communities who are actually in need. And alongside that, we've got just an inability to prioritise what's really important right now. So what could a more collaborative engineering approach do for us? First, to give a kind of broad definition, collaborative engineering um, is an approach that involves key stakeholders throughout the whole supply chain, working collaboratively collaboratively to create solutions, you know, resolve conflicts and make decisions on critical actions for any design and manufacturing project. There are a number of benefits to collaborating and sharing, a few of which I've pulled out here and that I'm sure you're, you're all aware of within your own movement. Um, so firstly, collaboration encourages innovation and continuous improvement. So when products are developed by a diverse group of global experts, you can really enjoy those iterative improvements over time as different projects provide learnings and improvements to an idea, um, especially for students and for smaller teams and companies. This is a really great way to get feedback from a huge global community and to ask for help through that kind of troubleshooting process, um, as well as get some new inspiration for projects. Additionally, collaboration using kind of open source hardware has been shown to reduce development costs as designers aren't reinventing the wheel. It can also increase return on investments as a better product can be made more quickly and shared to improve the lives of more people. So that's really exciting. Collaborative approaches can also um, help to minimise inequality in design uh, by again encouraging designers to bring in more diverse voices and by offering more opportunities for individuals to make changes to technologies to suit them and their communities. So one example we frequently come back to Engineers Without Borders UK is that you are 17% more likely to die in a car accident, if you, car accident if you are a woman. And that's because cars are designed for and tested by models representing the average male. So by increasing the diversity of design teams to better reflect the diversity of those people using products, we believe statistics like that could be minimised or entirely avoided. Um, and finally, in a kind of similar vein to that, collaborative engineering can really support the development of appropriate technology, and that's technology that is suitable to the social and economic conditions of an area that's using it. It also promotes self-sufficiency on the part of those communities, um, as it gives them an opportunity to design and develop their own technologies without having to start from scratch. And as a, as a result of that, open source hardware has been proposed as kind of a bridge for the technological, educational and cultural gaps between different communities and countries. So I've got a couple examples of open source hardware projects that I wanted to share just to illustrate what this can look like when it's designed for positive change 
um, and how you know valuable that is. So firstly, we've got water scope here, which is an open source microscope that can be used to test water for bacteria. This can pr be produced anywhere in the world, and all you need is a 3D printer, design files, some screws, and a webcam, which makes it a really cool way of getting high performance equipment into very low resource areas. Uh, Waterscope has conducted trials with communities such as refugee camps who are providing feedback to refine this technology and ensure it's entirely user centered. And considering, you know, how many people die from waterborne ba bacterial infections every day, that's about 2000 every day, which is more than malaria and HIV combined. Um, this is an absolutely crucial step towards ensuring safety for many communities. So that's already a great example there. Um, we've also got one called FarmBot here, which is a 100% open source technology that anyone can build, modify and share from their home. So, and users can really easily grow their own food. And this company is kind of founded on the belief that a more open food system is a better one. And of course, with food production being such a huge driver of global emissions and you know, countless other social and environmental issues, this is really important. Of course, this technology isn't free, but it demonstrates how open source hardware and um, can and is being used around the world to build a more globally responsible future and really highlights, I think, how you can democratise engineering because really anyone can be an engineer, um, I think. But while these projects are really interesting and impactful, what would happen if we applied an open source approach to the whole system? What does sector wide collaborative engineering using open source hardware look like in practice? Well, in 2020, we saw how this could work. In the response to COVID-19, engineers collaborated across borders in a way we rarely, if ever, see. So firstly, they played a vital role in the scale up of vaccine production and the logistics of transportation. How else were we going to go from that kind of small batch dosing to immunising millions of people around the world in that short period of time? Additionally, with lockdown presenting more challenges due to you know, the increased reliance on broadband and wireless communication, engineers collaborated across geographic and academic borders to ensure people could stay connected. And as it says on the screen there, one of the most remarkable aspects of this kind of coming together during COVID-19 was the sudden outpouring of open source designs and that's from individual sharing designs for face shields to 3D printing ventilator components. We saw engineers actually actively reach out to offer resources and expertise and even at a higher level private companies were committing at scale sw switching from clothing production to PPE and beer production to ethanol. And academic engineers were also making a significant contribution by supplying or developing medical equipment, opening up their facilities and providing expert advice, analysis and their engineering skills. And this level of collaboration was possible thanks to open hardware. So now imagine if our industry could actually realise these types of benefits on a global scale on a more permanent basis. This question is already being posed, you know, what if there were weren't design centers for each company, but an open source engineering organization where everyone like you know, technology providers, designers, contractors, operators could work together to really contribute and, and benefit. And what if companies weren't selling these isolated solutions, um, but we collectively had a, a deeper understanding of the communities using products and had more efficient ways of getting to the heart of the problems that we're trying to solve them. So engineers could deliver projects more quickly into a better standard. Off the back of the COVID-19 response, the Wilson Centre outlines a number of recommendations to achieve that kind of change, looking at areas to improve coordination between open source hardware communities, those communities in need and government, to build the scale and capacity of open source hardware, and to improve standards and regulations to support open source hardware. But we'd like to take some time to consider what our movements could also be doing. But before we have that conversation, I just wanted to provide you with some context around what we're doing at Engineers Without Borders kind of in this open source space. So we run a number of design challenges to transform engineering education and more recently to provide professionals with a space to rethink how engineering is taught and practiced through this design challenge format. Within these design challenges, participants come together from across the world to work on real world problems uh, without those kind of real world pressures and risks that can make it even more challenging. So this gives them the skills and knowledge and the experience we think to really address global and local issues. 
not only do we think this really helps to foster collaboration and communication skills that we're critically lacking in the sector, but all of the designs are submitted on a platform called CrowdSol, which you can see pictured on the screen there under Creative Commons. And this is an open source platform that enables anyone anywhere to pick up the designs and develop them. In a similar vein, all of our programmes that we are running are shared online with resources that will enable anyone to, for example, start their own design challenge. Now, that doesn't come without challenges, which is why we wanted to take some time to hear about your learnings and share our own um, and really consider the way our movements are interlinked. Um, these aren't challenges we'd necessarily share elsewhere, but in the spirit of you know, being open source and collaborating, we think it's really important to have that conversation. Um, and to kick things off, I know Emma's got a, a few reflections about our use um, of open source. So I'll hand over. Thanks, Mally. Um, I think when we are reflecting on, you know, what, what our beliefs are in this space, but also what we've been able to do and the, the real challenges in, in creating that, I think there's a few ways <laughs> to reflect. Um, so one is um, to reflect on why we do it and the other is to reflect on what we do and how we do it. Um, and I think reflecting on the kind of why piece is really interesting because, um, you know, open source is not the dominant way of working in the engineering world. Um, it, is, it is not. Um, and there's reasons for that. So reflecting on why we think that's required is, you know, there is, I think Millie's done a great job in kind of presenting that space, but I think one of the things that is worth kind of bringing to the front in front of our reflections is we need to reflect on the thinking that goes into engineering so the the beliefs that people hold the values that companies have the values that individuals have that is what we're touching on here like sharing is something that I'm sure many of us were taught as children <laughs> it is about that that belief system um, and whether or not how we work embodies that belief system um, because it's interesting to not so for us we have to reflect on that because we have to be able to identify where there's values and where there's value tensions um, because you know open source and sharing it's not it's not good in terms of it doesn't have a knock-on impact it's kind of seeing it as well there's different values in that there's different values around the right for everybody to to have access what they need but also at the same time there is um, a tension there around quality. You know, somebody who's professionally skilled and expert in designing something, maybe it's a water system for a city, you know, there is an expertise in that. Um, there is quality control that's required to make sure that that thing that's produced works for the vast many people that it impacts and does what it's meant to do, you know, provide clean water. Um, so there's this interesting tension between wanting to share the value there but also a value around quality and wanting things to be available in the world that that um are made by those who have the skills to do it um so there's an interesting kind of piece there and i think for us one of our reflections is it's important to identify values within what we're trying to promote but in a way that also can help influence others so helping businesses to identify their practices and processes and what they skill people in and yeah so trying to bring in that kind of lens of thinking quite deeply about things um or not thinking deeply depending how your brain works <laughs> some people think it's deep others think it's absolutely necessary and obvious part of, of what we should be doing so there's a kind of why reflection I think the reflection on why um, and then the reflection on how and what um, we have tried to do a bit of a radical exercise in collaboration and, and do it in different ways um, and I think one thing that's really clear to me in terms of how we do that with program partners who we work very intensely with or on platforms where we engage lots of people in a specific thing or in how we work in terms of sharing our resources. Um, I think there's one thing that comes with collaboration is about communication. And for me, just being able to see a range of our work, I would say that engineering isn't a natural communicator <laughs> like if you think of all the people within there's not a natural piece there around like being able to communicate with different disciplines and others so I think it's really key when we're working in teams or working 
on wide programs is we can speak the language of business, we can speak the language of social science or social sectors. We can talk to academics, but we can also talk to real people about what it is that we're doing. So that being able to speak and adapt to the different disciplines and, and understand what we're trying to say in that is really key. Um, I think also it's really challenging to work across cultural, across cultures, um, across different power dynamics, um, across you know, different levels of resourcing um, across different availability of time. So kind of being consciously aware of, of what it is we're trying to do and the, the, the shared objective, because what we found is actually it's really important to have like equitable partnerships where not everybody's given the same amount of time, but fundamentally that different bringing together of small, big organizations, well-resourced, not well-resourced, that kind of piece on what is the value you're bringing and recognizing that rather than just the time contributions. Um, so kind of exploring this term of equity within within collaborations how does that actually work um and where is the barriers to that you know if you know people feel that there is an imbalance is how do you address that in a way that yeah it's challenging we, we found it firsthand with our our programs um and i think the ip issue in engineering is is really dominant even with you know the program that Millie talked about is we'll then talk to partners who say great we're going to take those ideas and bring them in our business and create a business case and, and we're going to benefit from this and it's that principle of how do we change that piece of you know large multinational companies who have incredible power but also feel that competitive spirit is how do we change their mindsets um question mark <laughs> we have not got the answer there but I think it's an interesting reflection for us is the bigger the bigger power at play here how do we how do we influence that and yeah I think in terms of movements we'd love to share some thoughts and understand you know you mentioned a community council is like how do you structure your movement um how do you structure decentralized and have some level of kind of shared initiatives or kind of understanding that everybody can work together so it doesn't become decentralized and therefore separated is how do you unify that um but also how you organize i think it's really important and um, when we're talking about collaborative approaches is actually there's a hell of a lot of organization and facilitation involved in, in achieving it um, so those are our reflections. So a bit about, you know, identifying values at a Y level, um, recognizing that it is can be hard to collaborate and doing and experimenting with radical exercises in collaboration, um, and then kind of feeding and pulling out the key lessons from that. Um, how do we address the bigger powers at play? Um, and what learnings can we share from our movements? Um, we're we're I would say in a like kind of learning space in terms of movement organizing and community organizing. So yeah, we're all ears in terms of what, what others are doing.